Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this fourth lecture in this wonderful series on sleep. Um, it is our privilege this evening to, to welcome um, Dr. Greg Simons. Um, he would have been introduced by Professor Fegan on Monday. And at the end, then you can ask questions as we did, um, and we'll carry on until we've completed the questions um, yesterday. So please welcome Dr. Greg Simons. Thank you um, very much for the introduction, and thank you to the faculty for uh, hosting me this evening, and thank you to you for giving up the time and attending this. Um, so I've been tasked with the responsibility of just chatting about clinical sleep medicine and how sleep affects clinical disease and what we see uh, in patients. So just to kick things off, unlike these ladies and gentlemen here, uh, I have no declarations. I'm not sponsored by anyone in the sleep industry or CPAP devices. I have no vested interests other than having a personal interest in sleep medicine. So I'd like to kick off uh, with a brief outline, talking about some clinical numbers, and we're going to cover some interesting facts about sleep and its clinical impact. We'll review some of the disorders we sleep with sleep disordered breathing and discuss uh, who to investigate and how we investigate. And then we'll close off with a little bit on management, how we manage sleep apnea and its different varieties and different modalities we can use. And we'll touch on, uh, hopefully have some time for some questions. Um, the overall duration, not very long, so hopefully we can have a, an interesting question and answer time. So I think this question, why do we sleep, has been very well answered by Dale in her, in her first uh, lecture in the series uh, on Monday. But essentially, we die if we don't. We have to sleep. We need it for normal functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. And the average person will spend 32% of their life asleep. Um, so if you live to the ripe age of 90, you would have spent about 33 years of your life asleep. So therefore, it's a very important behavioral experience, um, but you have to ask why. And I'm sure as many of you know, who are parents yourselves, the minute you have a newborn baby in the house, you are guaranteed to lose anything between 400 to 750 hours of sleep, and that's just in the first year alone. And we know that sleep is essential and our social approaches to sleep have changed through the years. Um, in the Elizabethan era, William Shakespeare referred to sleep as oh, sleep or gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse. Uh, however, you know, through the mechanization and, and um, industrialization, it isn't referred to sleep as a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our caveman days. But we have to ask, well, what happens if we don't sleep? We know that the lack of sleep leads to motor incoordination. And this is particularly relevant for us as clinicians. You know, we often have our junior doctors who've been awake for some 30 hours uh, attending to our patients, assisting in surgeries. And you just have to wonder what effect that lack of sleep has on their clinical functioning. Uh, 17 hours of wakefulness is equivalent to two alcoholic drinks. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be entirely happy with a junior doctor assisting me who's been awake for 20 odd hours. The term sleeping like a baby is a bit of a misnomer, however, and perhaps it should be more sleeping like a teenager. They need 10 hours or more of sleep on a daily basis and suffer more from sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation than anyone else of any other age group. This ultimately leads to loss of cognitive function and increased risk of psychiatric disease, inhibits cognitive function and particularly inhibits cardiovascular and endocrine systems in a multitude of ways. Regarding the lack of sleep, there was a nice study in uh, New York State that looked at orthopedic registrars or residents. These are doctors specializing to become orthopedic surgeons and they found that half of the time they were fatigued and a quarter of the time they're actually functionally impaired leading to subpar care. So what about sleep disorder breathing? How do we study it and how does it manifest? So the EEG of sleep was only discovered as recently in the 1920s, uh, but it was only until the 1950s that the tracing of REM sleep were first described by Azarinsky. And we now know 
uh, that there are specific patterns, which Dale alluded to in her, in her first lecture, went through the hypnogram, describing the stages of sleep uh, and REM and non-REM sleep, which we, which we discussed. But essentially what we look at from a clinical perspective is the polysomnogram. And so this is a summary output of a number of parameters, including sleep, respiratory, cardiovascular, and movement signals. From a neurological perspective, we look at the EEG, we look at the electrooculogram, which is looking at eye movement. We look at the electromyogram, looking at muscle movement. From a respiratory perspective, we look at a number of respiratory parameters, including oral and nasal flow. Uh, there's a um, monitor measuring sound, particularly snoring. We look at respiratory, thoracic, and abdominal movement. We look at oxygenation or saturation levels, which is very topical at the moment with COVID. And in some centers, they'll even do transcutaneous carbon dioxide measuring. So we can put a probe on the skin, which warms the skin, and then can measure carbon dioxide. From a cardiovascular point of view, we look at heart rate, blood pressure, and the ECG through the night. So clearly, there's a broad spectrum of disease uh, that affects uh, the medical aspects of sleep. And we need definitions to know exactly where we're starting from. So the first and most important definition is that of apnea which we define as a complete cessation of nasal or oral flow for more than 10 seconds. And this needs to be associated with a desaturation of more than 4%. Hypopnea is defined as partial reduction of flow for more than 10 seconds, again associated with a partial um, reduction of oxygen saturations, again of 4%. And we combine these to form an apnea hypopnea index so how many times in an hour will you stop breathing or have reduced flow um, resulting in a desaturation? We then graded for severity and a normal AHI being less than five. So all of us will slow our breathing down. All of us will desat a little and provided as less than five events an hour, we're happy to accept that as normal. Some centers would even use a definition that if your AHI is less than 15 events an hour with no symptoms, you would not be considered to have sleep disordered breathing. But the minute you have symptoms with an AHI above five, you will have clinical disease of sleep disordered breathing. From the sleep study, we then derive three major clinical problems. The first and most prominent is obstructive sleep apnea. This is the prototypical large patient who snores heavily, stops breathing through the night, has poor quality, unrefreshing sleep, may wake up with a morning headache, um, excessive daytime somnolence, trying to sleep the whole time. Central sleep apnea is quite a different disease entirely. There are a number of different forms of this, but the commonest we see is in uh, other medical conditions such as heart failure, renal failure, respiratory failure where the respiratory center is inhibited by a number of other metabolic factors, and you lose the drive to breathe, resulting in, in uh, hypoxia. And last but not least is the obesity hyperventilation syndrome, more affectionately known as the Pickwickian syndrome. If you've read the book, The Pickwick Club, they make reference to a small, stout young gentleman who would fall asleep while standing up by the name of Pickwick, and hence the syndrome of Pickwickian syndrome, which is obesity hyperventilation syndrome. This is an interesting phenomenon in very large patients. The hormones produced by obesity inhibit the respiratory center. The mechanics of being so obese limit respiratory effort, and patients develop respiratory failure and excessive somnolence during the day. So the commonest problem is snoring. And we have to ask, well, why do we snore? It's, it's common. We know that the prevalence of self-reported snoring ranges anything from 15 to 90 percent, depending on awareness, a bed partner, uh, and cultural factors. But on, on average, 25 percent of the population snores. And it's not just men. While we know 40 percent of men snore, up to 20 percent of women snore, but not all snoring is pathological. Snoring can be a normal phenomenon. And Snoring in of itself is considered a very poor predictor of sleep apnea, okay, due to the high, very high prevalence of snoring. If you look at the 25% of people snoring, only about 10 to 15% of them will go on to have 
sleep apnea when you investigate them thoroughly. So relying on snoring in of itself is not a great tool to differentiate what we would call a simple snorer and someone having obstructive sleep apnea. We know that the snoring mechanism is an unpleasant low frequency vibration in the upper airway and it's derived from turbulent flow um, in the upper airway. The airway patency is maintained by a number of groups of muscles, the soft palate, the tongue, the hyoid apparatus, as well as the lateral pharyngeal walls. And there are a number of very primitive reflexes which coordinate these structures, particularly during the respiratory cycle, to ensure that they're patent. Unfortunately, a lot changes as we get bigger. There's remodeling in the upper airway, and we know that that tube that you breathe through okay, changes both in structure and function. Um, and what ultimately you get left with is a collapsible tube uh, under dynamic circumstances which changes the whole time. And just to remember the mechanics of breathing, we suck air into our chest. So we, therefore, we, if there's a propensity to collapse a tube and it's not supported, we will, we will do that. And that's essentially in the background uh, of sleep apnea. So what happens at night? There's a significant increase, increase in upper airway resistance, um, particularly supraglottic, so above the laryngeal inlet. And that can be um, as high as five to 10 liters per second. And we know that the airway dynamics, diameters change. For you, those of you who have an interest in physics, you may well remember that resistance is inversely proportional to, inversely proportional to the radius to the fourth power. So any small change in airway radius has a dramatic effect on airway resistance. The picture you see on the right um, is a very nice picture of an MRI of a patient awake uh, and then asleep. And what you're seeing in the wake picture is the opening of your, of your laryngeal, just above your laryngeal inlet, just at the base of the tongue. And you can see the dramatic change in that area when the patient sleeps. Uh, and that change, even albeit small, of that radius has a dramatic air effect on airway resistance. Now, an MRI is not a functional test. It's just an anatomical picture. So it tells us a, a snapshot in time. And that area that you see during the sleep phase will change quite dr dramatically. So who do we investigate? Well, obviously, the clinical history is very important. The history of excessive daytime sleepiness, a history of poor quality, unrefreshing sleep. Um, I think a collateral history from a bed partner is particularly important. Uh, in fact, what is really interesting, if a bed partner has to rouse or elbow a patient awake to stimulate them to breathe, that predicts the diagnosis of sleep apnea by as much as 90%. And um, there are a number of screening questionnaires, which I'll touch on in a minute, which we use to help assess patients and particularly the Epworth sleepiness score. Examination is important to make sure there's no anatomical or pathological conditions causing upper airway obstruction. So simple examination of the ENT system and oral cavity is useful. And then obviously what is necessary is special investigations. Unfortunately, there's no simple clinical predictor like a neck circumference or a chest circumference that will help differentiate uh, and uh, the issue of, if it, or predict rather, whether you have sleep apnea or not. You would have to uh, investigate those patients with a sleep study to make the diagnosis. It's also play, important to pay attention to the cardiovascular system. Uh, sleep apnea will increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, particularly stroke, renal disease, ischemic heart disease, the development of atrial fibrillation. Resistant hypertension and the development of early onset hypertension has been closely linked to sleep apnea. And we know sleep apnea will drive insulin resistance, therefore um, predict the onset of diabetes. So this is how we usually get our patients referred to us, uh, a patient brought in by a family member or a bed partner because the bed partner is not sleeping due to the noise and the uncertainty of their partner not breathing at night. Is it confined to men? Definitely not. There was a large population-based survey of 10,000 women aged between 20 and, 70, 20 and 70 years old, and they found a significant proportion, 50% in fact, had obstructive sleep apnea. 
and the prevalence of the sleep apnea was related to age, then obesity and BMI, presence of hypertension, and not specifically, interestingly enough, related to daytime somnolence or how sleepy they were through, through the day. And what you can see though clearly on the graph on the, on the right is that as the BMI increased towards the left, so the prevalence of sleep apnea increased, particularly with age. So if you had a BMI over 30 with, and you were over 55 years old, there was a very high prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea. So we use some standardized screening questionnaires to help uh, risk stratify those patients who should be identified for investigation. And the commonest one we use is the Epworth sleepiness score. And this has a number of um, parameters which we look at. We do look at the Berlin questionnaire, the stop and the stop bang questionnaire. These are clinical twos looking for the pretest probability of sleep disorder breathing. They're quite intensive and they're often used in research tools. It's not particularly useful in a clinical day-to-day -day basis, basis with patients. And then if we want to assess sleep quality uh, for patients already on CPAP or with other neurological sleep conditions, we would use the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. But again, this is predominantly used as a research tool. So the Epworth Sleepiness Score assists us uh, in assessing the patient's everyday sleepiness across eight different scenarios um, with a score of, of 10, um, excess, suggesting excessive daytime somnolence. So the, each situation is scored uh, from zero to three, with zero representing no chance of sleeping and three, a very high likelihood of dozing off to sleep. And a minimum score we'd want is a score out of, out of 10. So you'd rate the patient on sitting and reading. What is the propensity? What is the likelihood of you falling asleep watching television? What is the likelihood of sitting inactive in a public place? Would you fall asleep as a passenger in a car on a long distance trip, for example? Lying down, what are the chances of you um, having an afternoon nap should circumstances permit? And if you are talking and sitting, talking to someone, would you likely fall asleep? The chance of sitting quietly after lunch at your desk without alcohol. And if you yourself were driving, what is the propensity of you falling asleep? This is the Berlin questionnaire. You can see it's a lot more intensive and we use it for more research purposes than a daily clinical um, assessment tool. And the stop bang assessment is a surgical tool which anaesthetists and other clinicians will use prior to any operation um, to potentially identify any patients which have occult sleep apnea, which would impact their anesthesia, and particularly on waking from anesthesia when you're at high risk from obstructing and aggravating very low oxygen levels. So this is ultimately what we get. This is the nuts and bolts of a sleep study. Um, and what we're looking at here is primarily what we call polyography. So I'd just like to talk you through this. And following the laser pointer, you can see what I'm the tracing I'm pointing out are the oxygen levels or the saturations. As mentioned, this is very topical at the moment with COVID. I'm sure a lot of people will have an oximeter themselves and monitoring their oxygen levels, particularly if you've had COVID. And you can see how dramatically these oxygen levels change, going from 95 all the way down to 79, and then coming back up into the 90s and dropping down into the 70s. And you can see how this repeats. Uh, this is what we call a 10 um, second epoch. So this happened quite regularly uh, and quite often. Then related to this, there are flows. So these top two graphs or tracings rather represent nasal and oral flows. So you can see the patient moving air and then obstructs, moving air and then obstructs. And these periods of obstructions are then linked to periods of desaturation. This is very typical for obstructive sleep apnea. These two tracings highlighted here are movements of the chest and abdominal walls, so the patient trying to breathe with, with muscular effort. And you can see all three, even though there's no flow, the patient is trying to breathe, trying to breathe, trying to breathe, and then has a big effort to open up the airway, suck air in, get breathing, oxygen levels then pick up subsequently. On the bottom, we can see a tracing of the microphone picking up heavy snoring through the night. So this would be a patient with severe obstructive sleep apnea, severe desaturations into the 70s, and this patient um, would, <laughs> in fact, feel pretty terrible. It's an example of one of our patients uh, who had a equal sleepiness score of 22 out of 24, 
He weighed 151 kilos, giving him a BMR of 54. Um, so significant desaturations. So we've talked a little bit about why and um, why who should we investigate, but why should we investigate for obstructive sleep apnea? And the short answer really is that sleep apnea compounds metabolic disease. We know from a cardiovascular point of view, it's pro-inflammatory, it drives hypertension, it drives premature atherosclerosis, and therefore ischemic heart disease and peripheral vascular disease. It drives arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation, and could uh, herald the onset of early arrhythmias with no other comorbid diseases. From an endocrine perspective, it does increase your renin and aldosterone levels. It does uh, increase insulin resistance, which is quite topical at the moment. And from a neurological perspective, there's a strong association of, of sleep apnea with premature strokes and dementing processes. So you may say, oh, well, fine and good. I've got sleep apnea. Can't I just have an operation to fix this? Should I not just see an ENT? And you can open up my airway and make things better. So this has been looked at quite carefully through the years. And you can see a study here, the role of ENT surgeons in snoring assessment. And really what it highlights is that ENTs are useful if the patient has hard signs. And hard signs, I mean, has, is coughing up blood, has pain on talking, has a hoarse voice, um, has an obvious nasal polyp, then there's a definite role for an ENT to play. But in most of our, pa our patients, well over 90%, there are no hard signs. And in fact, if you scope everyone, um, you find very little. In our cohort, our initial cohorts of 300 patients, we scoped everyone. We found one patient who had a benign polyp, um, which improved with surgery. What about surgery curing um, sleep apnea? And the prototypical surgery offered to patients with sleep apnea has been the U triple P, uvulo palato pharyngoplasty. Uh, it's quite a mouthful. It's quite an invasive procedure and it results in significant complications and side effects. And uh, what the, the surgeon does is, is essentially reshape the larynx. Uh, they will remove part of the, they'll remove the tonsillar bed. If the adenoids are still present, they'll take them out. They'll cut away the uvula, which is the floppy hanging bit of the palate. They'll even reshape part of the tongue. And while it may look to the eye a very, very nice result, the procedure is, is fraught with problems. It's very rarely curative. Um, looking at this slide or this data from almost 200 patients, less than 20% had any change in their apnea hypopnea index, i.e. they still had sleep apnea. And most of them, up to 60%, had chronic complications following directly from their surgery. And this can include uh, voice changes, so which we call dysphonia. And this may not sound like a major problem, but if you don't sound like who you were, your quality of your voice changes, that can be particularly disturbing for some patients. 12 to 15% of pain are, patients are left with chronic pain on talking and swallowing. Okay, And some patients, up to 20%, are left with problems of swallowing and dysphagia, as well as nasal regurgitation of food. So you had a lovely dinner with your partner and you're enjoying each other's company and your spaghetti comes out your nose, which is particularly disturbing. So surgeons have thought, well, can we modify the technique? Can we use fancy devices such as laser surgery to assist with this, to minimize trauma? And again, they get a very nice cosmetic result, as you can see in the pictures. They'll go ahead and shave away part of the uvula. They'll take away the tonsils. They'll reshape the palate. Uh, they'll put sutures in the back where the tonsillar tissue was, and it looks very pretty, but you're left with the same problems. And it really is not effective and a very high rate of complications post-procedure. So what do patients think of surgery? And this was a nice study uh, looking at what patient perspectives of the surgery that I've mentioned. And in the study, really, you, they're comparing apples with oranges. If we look at uh, CPAP um, complications versus surgery complications, you know, the surgery complications were pain, incompetence, regurgitation, and voice changes, where CPAP complications were really 
pressure changes and a bit of mass system issues with air leakages. So you know, can't really compare the two, and they were dramatically more with the surgical group. Is there a role for nasal surgery in sleep apnea? And some surgeons will punt this. They'll say, well, we'll just straighten out your septum. To be honest, only people with straight septums are those that have had plastic surgery. We're all born with a deviated septum to some degree. None of us, nothing in nature is perfectly straight, and uh, nor are we. So those people who have a slightly deviated septum, that does not necessarily predispose you to sleep apnea. We do consider surgery in patients who are on CPAP machines with very high pressures. We may consider it. Uh, and in those patients who are simple snorers, proven on a sleep study, there is a role for surgery. A lot of other devices are punted. A lot of home remedies are um, marketed to improve snoring and cure your sleep apnea. I would be very cautious. There's no evidence for any of this whatsoever. So what about what else can we do to manage sleep apnea? Well, weight loss is critical, and we know that AHI improvements, the degree of, of severity of sleep apnea, improves proportionately with the weight loss. And approximately every 10 kilogram weight loss results in your AHI dropping by 10 events an hour. And we know that you are three times more likely to develop remission of your sleep apnea if you can stick to a weight loss. These studies have been relatively short, and we know maintaining weight loss is exceedingly difficult. And related to weight loss, we could say, well, what happens if we operate? What happens if we offer patients bariatric surgery, make their stomach smaller, decrease their caloric intake? Would that affect sleep apnea? It was a very nice meta-analysis. I looked at 340 patients, and we know the surgery was effective. They dropped their BMI from 55 down to 35. So even at 35, they were morbidly obese by definition. And we saw that their AHI came down from 55 to 16. However, only one third of patients achieved a normal AHI. So even 16 events an hour is abnormal, and we would consider that mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. And depending on whether you had symptoms, you probably still need treatment with a CPAP device. So what is CPAP? This is non-invasive ventilation. It means sleeping with a mask on, attached via a small hose or thin hose to a small pump or machine, if you will and it drives air into your airway. It's not extra oxygen, it's simply air under pressure, which acts as a mechanical splint to keep your airway open uh, and allow you to breathe uh, through the night. Does it work? Absolutely. We know there's good evidence that it improves the vasculature and the vascular tree. Uh, we know it improves sleepiness, both objectively and subjectively. We know it improves blood pressure, and in fact, probably drops blood pressure by more than many medications themselves. We know it reduces the risk of death and, and related to stroke. The, the issue of does it drop your mortality, does a CPAP device improve mortality is an interesting one. And a lot of the studies quoted will say, no, it doesn't change mortality. And, and, and the short answer to that is, well, that is correct. But when you dive into the detail of those studies and have a look at how compliant were the patients on the devices? If you can use a device for more than four and a half, four and three quarter hours a night, your mortality does drop. So if you can tolerate the device um, and use the device on a regular basis for more than say five hours a night, you are changing your lifespan and the quality of your life. So are there adverse events? Are there problems with CPAP devices? Well, obviously, if the mask fitment is key, and if the mask is not fitted well, it can lead to skin irritation and skin breakdown. Because we're blowing in through the night, there can be oral and nasal and even conjunctival dryness. Your mouth dries out, your nose dries out. We can get around that by adding a humidifier to the device to just to warm and humidify the air, which is always a which is always a good idea. And once again, because we're blowing air in and you swallow air while you're sleeping, it can lead to a bit of gastric distension in the morning. As mentioned, the mortality is directly related to compliance. So the more you use the device, the better your outcomes. So compliance patterns are established very early on in use of the device. If you take it up well, you'll continue to use it. If you have problems with mass fitment, um, leaks, 
complications from the mask, we know that then your compliance long term will be poor. And sometimes what we may need to do is give you a small sedative just for the first two to four weeks to get you used to the mask. Now, that may be a little counterintuitive. If we were to give all, all sleep apnea patients a sedative, it would aggravate uh, their sleep apnea, relax them more, cause more upper airway obstruction, depress their respiratory drive. But we know that with patients on CPAP, we can give them safely a small sedative, allow them to tolerate the device a lot better, the uptake of the device is better, and therefore their compliance over the long term is better. So I think that's all I have to say this evening. I would like to make special thanks to Dr. Ricky Rain and Professor Kit and Dida, who've um, supported us in getting a sleep service running at British Gear and UCT Hospital. This is a large team of people who make the service possible, um, and we're managing to do some research looking at sleep apnea as it occurs here in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. We've developed some close ties with the sleep staff at Sports Science, Sports Science Institute of Del Rey, and she's been fantastic. And I would just like to leave you uh, with some pictures of a recent trip to the Kalahari. I'm happy to take any questions and help wherever I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Simons. Um, uh, the question from Mel Watson is, what is an average time it takes to fall asleep after a normal active day? Why is it so difficult for some folks to fall asleep, especially if sleep is disturbed in the middle of one, one's night's sleep? Is insomnia an illness? So just to recap, time to fall asleep, primary insomnia is an illness. Okay, so I think those are very relevant questions, uh, and I haven't really touched on insomnia for, for good reason, uh, because it's an entity all on its own. So I think just to differentiate, primary insomnia is the ability, inability rather, to initiate sleep, and secondary insomnia is the inability to reinitiate sleep once you've woken up. So most of us will take five to 10 minutes, up to 15 minutes to fall asleep easily. I think that would be considered the normal um, time frame when we talk about sleep latency or the time to establish sleep. Generally, as a general rule of thumb, if you cannot initiate sleep, i.e. have primary insomnia, 98% of the time it's related to anxiety, depression, mood disorders, and not generally a medical condition. Having said that, there are medical conditions like thyroid illness, particularly thyroid toxicosis, um, which can cause you to, to have insomnia. Um, but as a general rule, if you've seen a physician excluded metabolic disease, had a thyroid test, the most common we see is just the general stress of life. I mean, I think I've seen a lot of patients in the last six months with primary and secondary insomnia. I think we discount uh, what our average days are going through, particularly with this third wave, um, families, losing family members. So I think um, primary insomnia is a difficult and challenging topic, which needs a lecture all in of itself. But I hope that gives some insights into our perspective of primary insomnia. The next question is from Robert Lund. You mentioned that the use of the CPAP machine reduces the possibility of a stroke. Why is that? Again, great question. Um, stroke is related to premature aging or one of the mechanisms of the vascular tree in the brain and the carotid vessels. And we now know while cholesterol and fats have a very important role to play in that, it's an inflammatory process. There are small hormones or cytokines which drive that inflammation and aging of the vessel. And what by giving CPAP or using CPAP rather, we prevent those cytokines. So you can imagine if you're sleeping, your oxygen saturation is dipped down into the 70s, 60s, even 50s, your body's flight or fight response will kick in. You will drive up those inflammatory cytokine hormones, your stress hormones, the adrenaline, the cortisols, the noradrenaline will hit the roof. And those hormones drive uh, premature aging of the vascular tree. So if we can switch off those stress hormones, your flight or flight hormones, it takes the strain and the premature aging off the vascular tree. So if we can keep your oxygen levels up with the CPAP, no hypoxic episodes, no low oxygen episodes, and therefore we don't get the premature aging, if that makes sense. Then there's a, qu a question from Andrew Fisher. Is there any association between restless legs during sleep and apnea? 
I do. Uh, good question. And not as far as I'm aware. Um, so I've kind of this evening stuck to the more obstructive uh, metabolic component of sleep disordered breathing. There's a whole raft of central sleep disordered breathing and central sleep disorders and restless legs falls under that. Um, along with cataplexy, apoplexy, um, central sleep apnea, there are a lot of movement disorders, including nocturnal epilepsy, restless leg syndromes, which are completely separate. And our approach to those is fundamentally quite different. Um, often seeing a neurologist is helpful to have those conditions diagnosed and then a specific group of medications used to treat those. Then there's a question from Yen. I can fall asleep in a concert. Why is it so difficult for me to fall asleep on a plane? I suspect it may be that I get woken up several times by interruptions and then secondary insomnia steps in. Good question. <laughs> so I don't know, I mean, it's a noisy environment. The light will play a big role. So in a lot of newer generation aircraft, you'll be aware that the lighting in aircraft is different. And this has been specifically designed to help with the transition from the sleep-wake cycle and to help with jet lag. So light has a, I think Dale touched on this on her first lecture on Monday evening about the impact of, of light. So if you're in a darkened hall, I think your brain will essentially sense that there's no light and will switch off and, and go to sleep. Whereas in an aircraft, the lighting is very different. A modern aircraft are a lot better. Um, there is a role certainly for melatonin, which is um, your own sleep hormone to help regulate your rhythms and help with jet lag. But I suspect that the light will be playing a big role uh, in your sleep on an aircraft. Okay, and then the question, or the part of the question is, is does secondary insomnia then step in? Yeah, so I think that, that speaks that you will wake up and then struggle to go back to sleep um, because your brain will think it's the middle of the day. There's a lot of research coming out now that light, and particularly blue frequency light, and this is the light we have from all our screens, it triggers your brain to think it's awake. So, for example, you use watch TV, use your iPad in bed, um, on your laptop, switch it off, and your brain takes about two hours to go to sleep after that screen time has come off. So, if you switch off your screen at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, your brain's only ready to go to sleep um, at about midnight. And then, you know, if you wake up at 7, you, you've only really had seven hours of, of sleep. And similarly, in an aircraft with the altered light, once you're awake, your, your brain will think it's middle of the day because of the light that's around you and you'll struggle to get back to sleep. Somebody's just commented here on, on a plane when sleep is disturbed by several interruptions by food and noises, then the lights are turned off. That does not seem to help, plus the chairs are uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here's another question from Walton. There's been no mention of sleepwalking. Does it occur in, in inverted commas normal? sleep again good question so the gambit of sleepwalking falls under the central sleep just movement disorders and it's a um, recognizable reproducible pattern of behavior uh, which commonly is managed by neurologists and um, psychiatrists we don't see it a lot and um, it obviously does occur and i don't have a lot of experience with it to be honest we would generally refer them on to the neurologist for assessment and make sure there are no other complex movement disorders at night. I'm sorry, I can't answer more than more than that. Um, I wanted to ask you about these night terrors that young children have, um, and they seem to come at us exactly the same time, 40 minutes after they go to sleep. Um, do you know anything about those? Um, I think, I mean, Marjorie, thanks for an um, interesting question. I think I don't have a lot of experience. I primarily deal with adults. Yes. Uh, so yeah. I'm a little out of my depth, but it's interesting you mentioned the timing. So it takes us about 40 to 50 minutes to start going into REM. And that's kind of when we're dreaming in stage three and then REM sleep. So, I mean, night terrors are essentially a very vivid dream, which are, are very real uh, for the patient undergoing that. So your timing spot on but I don't have a lot of experience with them whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, all of us dream at night. We just don't yeah. remember. But he, they us. seem to be, they seem to be still asleep. Yes, absolutely. You know, my grandson has had yeah. has had that and, and yes. they run up and down the passage and round and round the room. Yeah. Um, and they're not aware that 
they 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 appear to be asleep. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean for them it's almost. I mean, I mean, think the adult version will be sleepwalking. I mean, they're they're not aware they're asleep. It's a complex pattern of behaviors which their consciousness is impaired. So yeah, they won't. You know, they won't be aware that they're doing that. Um, yeah. Okay. But Thanks. I, you said sorry. I don't know. I deal mainly with adults. Yeah. Uh, in okay. the metabolic arena. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I think we do need to thank people like Dr. Summons for the for the wonderful work they're doing in this very difficult time. No problem. I'm happy so, to take thank any questions about COVID if anyone has, has any. Here's a comment from Mel Walton that says, thank you for all the hours of work you have been doing at Rutherskir, Dr. Greg. For the COVID patients, it is so difficult to find the right words to thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind words. It's uh, It's been very... Um, yeah, it's relentless and it's taxing and it's uh, it's uh, being soul destroying. Uh, so I think uh, all of us are pretty much at our wit's end at the moment. So our third wave, and we just want to get everyone vaccinated and get rid of the UK is where they're seeing large numbers of infections, but no deaths and hospitalizations are coming down. So yeah, we got to push hard for that and 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 get everyone needles into arms. So that's bottom line. Well, that, that I couldn't agree more. And this relates to the next question from Christina Ru Christine Ruiz. Recovered. What are your thoughts about the requirement for a top up vaccine? When would when would yeah, when would this be necessary? I think that's a great question, and it's very topical uh, in the medical fraternity at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of evidence and a precedent in other diseases like pneumococcal disease. Uh, hepatitis where we have booster vaccines or injections um, to cover waning antibody levels or dropping antibody levels. Uh, we know every vaccine has different efficacy against different strains. So for example, all the medical uh, fraternity, we got vaccinated in February with the J&J. &J. And we know the J&J &J doesn't cover the Delta variant, which is circulating now at the moment, or doesn't cover it well, should I rather say. And there's much debate about should we get a Pfizer booster? So have two different vaccines which will cover different strains um, to greater or lesser degrees. Uh, as I said, there is a precedent in other diseases to do this. You can test for what we call neutralizing antibodies, uh, which I think is useful. Uh, there was a study in Spain, I think it was, where they looked at healthcare workers who got infected after the J&J &J vaccine. And most of them who got infected after the vaccine had no, did not produce neutralizing antibodies. So to know whether you have appropriate antibodies, I think is useful. But I think if for the general public who are going out and getting the Pfizer vaccine, I think that's fantastic. It'll cover the Delta variant. And just understand that the vaccine doesn't prevent infection. You can still get COVID, but what it does prevent is death and hospitalization. So your rates of death and hospitalization drop dramatically. And I think we still need to be sensible mask um, wearing, mask etiquette, social distancing, um, hand hygiene is critical. But I think, again, there's more evidence now that if you're socializing outdoors with appropriate distancing, the risk of transmission is very low. I know a lot of people concerned in seeing families and, and you know, the loss of the human contact has been dramatic, um, I think is an easy, mild way to put it. So I would encourage people to socialize, but, but responsibly. Outdoors, um, mask etiquette, and I think, you know, life has to continue. COVID's not going anywhere, but we just need to be sensible. But getting back to the topic of vaccine, definitely two Pfizer vaccines and your immunity four weeks after that second vaccine, we dramatically improved. And if you're unsure, you can get tested for neutralizing antibodies. But as I was just saying earlier, perhaps, I mean, just, it doesn't make it into the press, but the severity of this wave, you know, from a hospital perspective, um, Credit must go to the hospital managers here at Kuriskir and New South Hospital. They've ramped up the resources dramatically. So at the moment, we're looking after 52 ventilated patients, 50 high flow patients, and 250 patients in the general ward on oxygen. So the hospital is consuming in the region of 5.1 million liters of oxygen a day. Um, so we'll go through 10 tons of liquid oxygen in 24 hours at the moment. And if that doesn't get replenished every four days by Afrox, we're in big trouble. Um, so I think a huge yeah. credit must go to the technical staff, uh, the logistics and the management for putting systems in place that we can do that. Um, you know, it's, it's very much a team effort. You know, without oxygen, patients die. Um, and so, you know, the engineers who run the hospital 
probably save more lives than we ever will by ensuring that we have a constant supply of oxygen. Just thank you so much for taking the time to prepare a lecture and present a lecture in this very, very busy time. Thank you very, very much indeed.